Good afternoon. We are going to be looking at some words today from the third chapter of Genesis. So let me read them for us and then try to unpack them a little bit. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. So one of the Bible's favorite things to do is ask questions. For example, in the Gospels, Jesus asks 307 of them. He is asked only 183 questions, and of those 183 that he is asked, he answers fewer than 10. So we sometimes trick ourselves into thinking that Christianity is all about answers, and it's in part about answers, but it is pretty centrally also about questions. Christianity is in part a practice of learning to ask well-formed questions and then having the boldness to ask them. If you were this past Sunday in an Episcopal church, you heard in the scripture readings a whole batch of questions, real doozies. This past Sunday, we heard, mortal, can these bones live? And we heard, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? The week before that, many of us in our churches heard the story from the Gospel of John about the blind man. By my count, that one Gospel story includes 16 questions. So the Bible is always asking them, what are you looking for? It asks us. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? Do you love me? It asks. And the reading we just heard from Genesis includes the second, third, and fourth questions that the Bible asks. The serpent maddeningly gets the first question in the Bible. The serpent says to Eve, did God tell you you shouldn't eat from a given tree? But God gets the next questions, and we're going to look for a few minutes today at God's first question, the second question in the whole of the Bible. Where are you? It's interesting to me that God and people and even animals in the Bible ask so many questions. Linguists tell us that questions do a whole lot of work for us in conversation and in our written texts. Questions elicit information. Questions stimulate thought. That's why good teachers ask so many questions of their students instead of just lecturing at them. And questions sometimes can forge intimacy. So think about getting together with a friend you haven't seen in eight months for coffee or lunch, and think about the role that questions play in your conversation with that friend. You're there and asking questions of one another exactly because you're interested in each other, or because you share some interest in a third thing, and the questions both reflect your shared interest and deepen your shared interest, and you come away feeling closer to your friend. So 
questions elicit information and stimulate thought, and they build closeness. They build intimacy. And that, I suspect, is one of the reasons the Bible includes so many of them. Maybe all the questions in the Bible help create intimacy among and between the people reading the Bible and between the person reading the Bible and the God of whom the Bible speaks. So let's go back to that first question that God poses in Genesis, Ayaka. It is in Hebrew. It's just one word in Hebrew. Ayaka, where are you? Now that seems, at first blush, to be a pretty straightforward question. If I ask you where you are, you might say, I'm at church, I'm in Memphis, I'm downtown. But of course, it's not actually a completely simple question, and it doesn't only elicit simple, straightforward answers. The geographical answer might lead to an emotional answer. I'm in church, but actually I'm not totally sure if I want to be here, and that's why I came to this atypical midweek service, because it's less of a big deal to go to a midweek service than to come to church on Sundays. Or, where am I? Well, I'm still at my house, but I just turned 75, and where I really am is scared that I won't be able to stay here much longer. Where I really am is in the grip of fear. Or if I ask you where you are, you might say what my friend Laura said when I saw her last month. She's from Memphis, but she just got remarried after a kind of whirlwind midlife romance, and she moved off to California. And when I saw her last month, she said, well, I do really miss Memphis, but in many ways, I'm in the best place I've been in years. Or you might say you're in between, in between your mother, who seems to need endless care and attention on the one hand, and your teenage son, who thinks he doesn't need any of that, or if I ask you where you are, you might tell me you're next in line. That's where you are after the death of both your parents. Where are you is not a simple question. It's a question that can open up and down, and it's a question that points inside and out, and that means it's a useful question and an unnerving one. Another thing to say is that in the story from Genesis, our question is, strictly speaking, unnecessary. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? The question is unnecessary because the one asking is God, and God is all-knowing, and thus God presumably already knew where Adam was. So if questions are only about obtaining information, God doesn't need to ask. So this must be a different kind of question then, not just an information-gathering question. The 11th century rabbi and great Bible commentator Rashi said that this question, Ayaka, where are you, this question shows us something about what God wants. It shows us something of God's desire. If God just wanted to punish Adam and Eve for eating that apple, some of the rabbinic commentators say actually it was a quince, but whatever, if God just wanted to punish Adam and Eve for eating their fruit, God could simply have leapt into the punishment. God could have just shouted a bunch of declarative sentences that ended in exclamation marks. If God just wanted to chastise, God didn't need to ask anything. But, says Rashi, 
the text shows us that God doesn't just want to punish Adam and Eve. God's first desire is to have a conversation with them. God wants to draw Adam into conversation, so God asks him a question. It's a question that intends exactly to call forth a response, and it is a question designed to foster intimacy between the one who asked and the one who answers. Adam's reply is pretty interesting. When asked, where are you, Adam says, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. The question has invited Adam to confess his condition, to tell God what state he's in, and Adam gives a pretty good answer. It's an answer with a lot of self-knowledge. Adam knows he's afraid, and Adam knows he's hiding. Most of the time in our own lives, we don't know that we're hiding. Most of the time in my own life, it takes me a good while to see that I'm hiding. We are winding our way through Lent, and this question in Genesis, the first of many questions that God asks in the Bible, this question is, I think, a deeply Lenten question. Where are you before God? And what is it you feel you have to hide? Most of us are hiding from something most of the time. We might be hiding from knowledge that we'd rather not have. Like when you know you're in a relationship that needs to change, but you don't want to deal with it. So you skulk around evading yourself and the wisdom that you actually possess. Or in a much more mundane key, sometimes you get really behind on email and you start hiding from the colleague to whom you owe a response. Or sometimes we hide from a desire. We hide from good desires, desires for prayer and peace. We hide from those good desires because we get distracted and we don't let ourselves attend to them. But we also hide from desires we ought not have. Like, there's this woman in my exercise class whom I really can't stand. She's in much better shape than I am and she does every single exercise with about 17 times more energy than I do. And once, after I went out of town for a couple of weeks, I returned to class and she had taken my spot. <laughs> I always had the spot closest to the door, which was a signal of my ambivalence about being there in the first place, you know. Now Helen is in that spot. And I have a secret desire to trip her <laughs> and break her ankle. <laughs> and then she wouldn't be able to come to class for like at least three or four months, and during those months while she was laid up in traction, I could get my spot back. Probably it would be better if I did not have this desire at all. But since I do have it, it would be better if I didn't keep it wrapped up and festering, but rather if I acknowledged it, as Bishop Curry likes to say, bring everything into the light. Where are you? It's a question that invites us to notice what we're hiding from and to come out from the hiding. Hiding is deeply connected to where we are right now in our calendars, in our church calendar and in our civic calendar. In our civic calendar, of course, and, and an outsider from North Carolina does not need to tell this to Memphis. In our civic calendar, today is a day of deep sobriety and sorrow. And as I was preparing to come to Memphis on the anniversary of Dr. King's being shot, I found myself thinking about what martyrdom is. The martyrs of our society are the ones who do not hide. Adam and Eve prevaricated. 
but martyrs, by definition, don't prevaricate. They boldly proclaim the truth that they have been given. And Adam and Eve hid, and the martyr exactly does not hide. The martyr shows himself, even when he knows that his refusal to hide is likely to get him killed. So that's where we are in our civic calendar. We are commemorating the death of one who refused to hide his body and who refused to hide his gospel, even though that refusal carried with it deep risk. But most of us are not martyrs. We're all being called beyond our hiddenness, but most of us, definitely myself included, most of us don't have the martyrs courage or resolve, and most of us do our dance of hiddenness and exposure at a much more mundane level. So as a church, we're making our way through Lent. Holy Week is just around the corner, and despite our waffle shop lunches, many of us have done that thing, that Episcopalian thing that we do, of giving up something for Lent, giving up coffee or wine one year, I gave up reading for Lent. A couple of years ago, I gave up anxiety. It did work. I spent that Lent noticing when I was beginning to feel some creeping anxiety and just telling myself I couldn't feel it for the next 15 minutes. And I lived the entire Lent in this 15-minute increment pattern. And then on Easter, when all of my friends were like eating chocolate cake and having coffee, I had a really delicious, long anxiety attack. <laughs> This year, I've given up internet shopping for Lent, and I've only lapsed once, I'll note. All this stuff we give up, wine, anxiety, shopping, these things we give up for Lent are not inherently bad things. They're just the ways we have of hiding. We hide inside the wine glass, or inside the anxiety, or inside the dessert. Why did I break my Lenten fast? from internet shopping last week and purchase a linen dish towel from a boutique in France. Why did I do that? I did it because a friend had sent me a really upsetting text message and then turned her phone off. And I felt worried and anxious and hurt and angry, and I really wanted to hide from those feelings. And frankly, the internet shopping did the trick for a couple of hours. It was a nice, distracting narcotic. So the things we give up during Lent are just the doors we hide behind for the rest of the year. And when we give them up for six weeks, when we take the doors off the hinges, and instead of hiding behind them, we repurpose those doors as headboards or picnic tables, when for a few weeks we set aside the wine and the internet shopping and the coffee, that's just a way of showing God and showing ourselves the things we ordinarily hide. That's what Lent wants. At its core, it wants to draw us out of hiding. We've still got 11, 11 I think, 11 days of Lent left. We've still got 11 days of Lent left. For those days, Perhaps allow yourself to hear this question. Hear it posed to you by God, and hear it posed to you by your most true self. Ayaka, where are you? <laughs>